weeks old. Verse 38 says, Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of, Israel, of Jerusalem. When Mary and Joseph had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Um, I think at the heart of this passage is this poem that is recited by Simeon. And I want to just key you in to verse 30, because I think it's at the heart of what we need to talk about today. He says, For my eyes have seen your salvation. So he, he says when he sees this, this child, the parents coming up, he says, I've seen something here, which you have prepared in the sight of all people. So he's basically saying, look, this is in the sight of everyone. It's out in the open. Everyone can see it. Uh, but my eyes have seen it. Um, Maybe we can go at it this way. So in your minds, try to imagine what the scene was like, and I'll, I'll try to give you some context. So um, when our first daughter was born, we were, we were in this fairly small hospital in a very rural town of Zeeland, Michigan, and uh, there were at least three or four other babies that were born in that hospital the same day. When my second daughter was born, we actually drove down to the hospital we got there, and we went up to the nurse's station, and I said to the nurse, my wife's in labor, she's going to give birth. And the nurse said, are you sure? And I said, yeah, I'm pretty sure. And she said, oh, well, we've got a problem. There are no more beds. And uh, so they ushered us out of the labor and delivery area into just a normal hospital bed. Uh, there were so many other babies that were being born that day. So this is in Stewart, Florida, not a large place. So... In both cases, when my two daughters had been born, there were a number of other babies born that exact same day in a fairly rural place. So, my question to you is, in the city of Jerusalem at that time, or maybe we can think about the whole country of Israel, how many babies would have been born the same day of Jesus? And if it was a normal custom that at day 40, you would bring these children to the temple to dedicate these children to the Lord and to go through the process of purification, if that was the normal process... On any given day, how many parents would have gone into the temple to present their babies before the Lord and so on? Uh, there would have been a good number of young couples who on that day would have been coming up. And, and besides that, on any given day when you were there, you would have seen these young couples coming to present their children before the Lord, which was customary to do. And if you can just picture, okay, you're standing in the temple now. You see all these young couples. How many other people are there doing a whole variety of other activities? Making offerings, uh, offering sacrifices. So the temple is just, it's buzzing with things going on. Normal, everyday things that if you were there every day, you would see them. And uh, so you see all these couples coming, and uh, it's in front of everybody. But Simeon, who's tuned in to the Holy Spirit, moved by the Holy Spirit, guided by the Holy Spirit, told by the Holy Spirit that he's not going to die before he sees the Christ, when he sees this particular uh, young man and young woman coming with their baby in arms, he goes and he grabs that child in his arms. And he says, my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all people. So it's in front of everybody, but, but when I saw it, I, I had this insight. He saw it. And then there's Anna, who clearly she's devoted herself to worship of God. She, I think we could also say, is tuned in to God. When she sees this sight, which is in front of everybody, she sees something unique, something holy, something set apart, something special. And she too goes up to this, this, this set of parents and, and speaks about how this child is going to bring salvation and redemption to Jerusalem and to Israel. So in this, this story, we have two people who, because of their being in tune with the Holy Spirit or because of their being in tune with God in worship each and every day, they, although everyone sees the same sights, they have this special insight. They have this special vision to see what God is doing. Which I think brings up this theme that I want to talk about. Um, I'm going to go through the scriptures here, and probably as we look at these scriptures, you, you may say to yourself, well, what does that scripture passage have to do with the one before it? It's almost as though I want to present a mosaic, and hopefully as we stand back at the end, uh, you'll see this theme emerge 
first place I want you to turn is just a couple pages back. Mark chapter 14. Um, we're going to read verses 1 through 9. So just page back a couple of pages. Hopefully you still have your Bibles open before you. <clears throat> um, it starts out this way. Now the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were only two days away. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or the people may riot. So that kind of sets up the scene that we're about to um, envision. And what I'd like to have you do as we read these next words is try to actually, with your mind's eye, your imagination, envision this upcoming scene. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. So hopefully in your mind's eye, you, you have the scene, right? You have, hopefully you can picture it, Jesus. He's reclining at a table. There are a number of other guests who are there at some point in the dinner. A woman comes through the door. She's carrying a jar. It's an alabaster jar. It's filled with perfume. Uh, we're told that the perfume's very expensive. In fact, uh, later there's reference to the fact that it's worth a year's wages. So put this in today's term. What are we talking about here? Maybe 40, 50, 60, 70,000 um, dollars. Very expensive perfume. And she breaks that jar, and the oil and perfume runs out over Jesus as she anoints him. The disciples who are there, they, they see the scene with you. They see Jesus reclining at the table. They see the woman enter. They see the jar. They see the money. Um, and the Bible says they're indignant. They're angry at this woman. They say, this, this could have been sold and the money given to the poor to feed the hungry. And after all, Jesus' ministry, as you begin to read about it, he was concerned with the people at the margins, the people who were poor. He, he, he went to people that everyone else overlooked. And he was concerned that people be treated equally with justice and that, that you give to those who are in need. And so the disciples who've picked up on what Jesus' ministry is all about, they're angry with this woman. And if you're watching on, um, you know, the disciples see in that jar the money that could have been spent on the hungry mouths that they also see. That's what they see. I suggest to you that Jesus sees something different, something deeper. She says in, he says in verse 6, Leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you'll always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Which I guess is what we're doing right now. We're recounting the memory of this moment, right? Uh, Jesus, I suggest, sees something different than the disciples. They see the perfume. They see the money that could have been spent on the hungry mouths. Jesus, who I would say is in tune with what God is doing right then. I mean, the verses start out talking about how this was the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Breads, the chief priests and the teachers of the law looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus so they can put him to death. He's in tune with what God's doing. The fact that he's going to suffer, the fact that he's going to die, be crucified, eventually be buried. And when this woman comes in with the perfume, what he sees is this sacred act of worship. He sees something special in what this woman's doing that she has prepared or anointed his body for the suffering and ultimately the burial, the death that he's going to undergo. And so he says, leave her alone. He sees something the disciples don't see. Um, next scripture passage I want to have you look at with me. Genesis chapter 28. So turn with me uh, really to the beginning of... Uh, 